Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing gastric acid secretion. Okay, so in this next video what I want to discuss is how uh, neural input to the stomach in the form of uh, postganglionic parasympathetic cholinergic neurons uh, can stimulate uh, the parietal cells to secrete uh, more hydrochloric acid. So basically, the vagus will become active and uh, will stimulate the parietal cells to secrete more uh, hydrochloric acid when you have eaten a meal, okay? So the brain will also be sending out signals uh, which are telling the stomach to secrete more hydrochloric acid. Gas the G cells aren't alone, basically. They've got backup. Okay, so let's discuss then how uh, the vagal cells are going to stimulate uh, the um, parietal cells. Okay, so let's say we have here our sensory neuron, uh, sorry, our postganglionic parasympathetic neuron here. Okay, and here's its axon terminal right at the end here. Okay, so this uh, is some postganglionic, okay, so it's the uh, neuron after the parasympathetic ganglion, okay, postganglionic, and it's parasympathetic, so it's part of the rest and digest system, sympathetic, and then it's a neuron. Oh, and I'll put one more big word in there. It's also cholinergic, which means it's going to be secreting acetylcholine. So a postganglionic parasympathetic cholinergic neuron, and it's coming from the vagal nerve. Okay, now of course you have two vagal nerves. Uh, you have a right vagus nerve and a left vagus nerve. Now, uh, both of them will be supplying fibers into uh, the stomach. Okay, so, uh, in comes uh, the um, postganglionic parasympathetic cholinergic neuron, and uh, basically it's going to be secreting acetylcholine. Okay, so out comes acetylcholine. And let's just discuss the structure of acetylcholine. Okay, so basically acetylcholine is an ester between acetic acid and the alcohol choline. Okay, so let me show you the structure of acetic acid, and then we'll discuss how you can esterify acetic acid with uh, choline, which is an alcohol, to produce acetylcholine. Okay, so here is acetic acid, which is the old name for ethanoic acid. Okay, so this is what you have within vinegar. It's the two-carbon carboxylic acid. Then we have the alcohol choline. So here's the alcohol group. Then we have an ethylene group, so choline is a very simple alcohol. It has an alcohol group, then an ethylene group, and then off the ethylene group you have a nitrogen atom, which then has three methyl groups coming off it. Now nitrogen atoms should not have four bonds. Nitrogen atoms should have two bonds. So in one of these bonds, sorry, they should have three bonds. Uh, in one of these bonds, the nitrogen atom has uh, put both electrons in, basically. Okay, and therefore, since the understanding of a covalent bond is that one electron has come from each member, when the nitrogen puts both members in, it's as though the nitrogen has given away one electron to the other member. Okay, so the nitrogen gains a positive charge. And you might wonder, well, has the other member gained a negative charge? Well, no is the answer, because when this other member here, this methyl group, came in to form this covalent bond, uh, basically that carbon would have had a positive charge. Okay, so when it received that extra electron from the nitrogen, it neutralized itself, so it's now neutral and it's effectively passed on the positive charge to the nitrogen atom. Okay, so this is the alcohol choline. And basically, acetylcholine is acetic acid it's stirified with choline. So what you'll do is you'll take the alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, you'll take the hydrogen off the alcohol group of the choline molecule, you'll combine those together to make water, and then you'll bind this carbon here to this oxygen over here via an ester link, and that creates you acetylcholine. And for short, acetylcholine is often abbreviated to A for acetyl and then CH for choline. Now, the acetylcholine is going to be stimulating the parietal cells. So let me put a parietal cell here. Okay, so here's the nucleus of the parietal cell. 
And basically, these parietal cells will have uh, M3 receptors on their surface. And what we want to see is why M3 receptors are also going to stimulate these parietal cells to secrete more hydrochloric acid. So basically, the postganglionic parasympathetic cholinergic neurons release acetylcholine onto the parietal cells, and that increases the amount of hydrochloric acid that these parietal cells are going to secrete, basically. So what we now want to discuss is what's the pathway underlying that. So basically, it's another G-protein coupled receptor pathway. Okay, so this time we are dealing with an acetylcholine receptor, and we're dealing with a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, all of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are once again in the family of rhodopsin-like G-protein-coupled receptors, uh, just like uh, the H2 uh, uh, G-protein-coupled receptor uh, was. Okay, so that means, remember, that the uh, ligand is bound uh, by residues which are within these transmembrane domains, so these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. So the ligand will be bound somewhere in here, maybe. Okay, so in comes the acetylcholine, and it will bind to this M3 receptor. Okay, so this is M3, and the M stands for muscarinic. So there is an entire family of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors uh, named because uh, muscarine is an agonist for them. Okay, so this is the muscarinic free acetylcholine receptor, or the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor type 3. Right, so basically what will happen is uh, the acetylcholine will come and bind to the M3 receptor and it will bind to residues within the membrane spanning alpha helices. It will then trigger a conformational change in the M3 receptor that is relayed down to the intracellular loops here, intracellular loop 1, intracellular loop 2, intracellular loop 3. These intracellular loops change conformation to make available a binding site for the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, And the heterotrimeric G protein, the M3 receptors uh, interact with is what is known as a GQ heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, and once again, the subscript here does not tell you what the beta and the gamma subunit are. It only tells you what the alpha subunit is. Okay, so it tells you that the heterotrimeric G protein we're working with here has an alpha subunit that is the alpha Q uh, subunit. Okay, so here's the alpha subunit shown here. And basically, I haven't really, I'm going to have to squeeze this in. It's an alpha Q subunit, okay? So uh, it's one of the 16 genes, basically, for alpha subunits. Now, initially, of course, the alpha Q subunit will have GDP bound to it and will therefore be in the off state, okay? And in the off state, it will associate with a beta gamma complex. Uh, and remember, the gamma protein of the beta-gamma complex has the um, lipid uh, group attached to it, which anchors it in the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, and the beta subunit just binds to the gamma subunit, and that's how it remains at the phospholipid by there. Okay, so here we have our heterotrimeric GQ, heterotrimeric G protein, and once the uh, M3 receptor has got the acetylcholine bound, uh, it will be able to bind this GQ, heterotrimeric G protein. So this will bind into the intracellular uh, domain of the um, M3 receptor, and what will happen then is that the alpha Q subunit will release the GDP molecule, and instead a molecule of GTP from the cytoplasm will come in and bind here instead. Okay, And this is all happening whilst the whole thing is still bound to the intracellular domain of the um, G protein coupled receptor. And once the alpha Q has GTP bound to it, it will then break away from the beta and the gamma subunit. And then both of these two separate uh, complexes now will leave the G protein coupled receptor. So the alpha Q with its GTP will leave the G protein coupled receptor. And also the beta gamma complex will leave the G protein coupled receptor. And they'll then go and stimulate downstream targets. Okay, so let's draw this here. So here we have the alpha Q uh, subunit, 
which has a GT peak, guanosine triphosphate now bound to it here. So this is guanosine triphosphate, okay, and it's an alpha Q subunit, okay, and then we also have beta gamma over here, uh, which will remain bound together, okay, so under no physiological circumstance to the beta and gamma subunit ever split apart. So this is called the beta gamma complex. Okay, and basically, alpha QGTP is now going to go and act on uh, an enzyme which is within the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, okay? So it's within the plasma membrane. So here is the target for the alpha QGTP uh, subunit then. Okay, so uh, this enzyme which is within the lipid bilayer is a phospholipase C enzyme, and specifically it's a phospholipase C of the beta type, okay? So PLC beta, and this stands for phospholipase C beta. So the P is for phospho, the L is for lipase, the C is for C, and then it's of the beta family. Okay, so the alpha Q GTP subunit will come and bind to the phospholipase C uh, beta enzyme and will activate it. Now, what does the phospholipase C beta enzyme uh, do once it's been activated? Well, basically, it works on a substrate which is within the lipid bilayer, and its substrate basically is PIP2 molecules. Okay, now PIP2 stands for phosphatidyl inositol. That's the first P. Phosphatidyl is the first P. I is for inositol, and this is all one big word, phosphatidyl inositol. So the PI is for phosphatidyl inositol. Then it's 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, so the second P here is for phosphate, and then because we've got two phosphate groups, you put a little two underneath. So this is phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Phosphatidylinositol with two phosphate groups stuck onto it. Okay, so I want to draw you a little cartoon of this molecule uh, to try and give you some understanding of what it is and why it is present within the lipid bilayer. So basically, what you will see is that basically it's just a modified phospholipid. It's just a modified version of the normal old boring old phospholipid that you usually think of as being present within the phospholipid bilayer. So basically, let's start by drawing out the structure of a normal old boring old phospholipid. Okay, so let's draw it here. So basically, if you were asked to draw a phospholipid, you might draw something like this. Now, let's just um, label up the different portions. So these two vertical lines that I've now coloured in orange, these represent the long chain carboxylic acids, which are esterified to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Okay, so long chain carboxylic acids. Okay, and the other name for long chain carboxylic acids is that they are also sometimes called fatty acids. And long chain carboxylic acids is kind of like the chemist's name for them. And fatty acids is what a biochemist might call them. Okay, uh, now the backbone of the normal phospholipid structure is then a glycerol molecule. So this horizontal line I've now coloured in green, uh, this is meant to represent the glycerol molecule, okay? Uh, and the proper name for glycerol is propane-1,2,3 triol, okay? And although propane-1,2,3 triol is a bit of a mouthful, it's a useful name because it tells you exactly uh, what this molecule's structure actually is. It tells you that we're dealing with a free carbon uh, structure which has alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third uh, carbon, basically. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.